very good to see you all this morning. If you will, open to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, as we study a lesson on the manifold wisdom of God. The God of the Bible is presented to us as an all-wise God. He created the universe and the laws that govern this universe. In Hebrews chapter 4, it describes him as one who sees all things, that all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul describes God's foolishness as wiser than the wisdom of men. This all-wise and all-powerful God manifest his wisdom, Ephesians 3 tells us, in the church. In Ephesians chapter 3, we want to read verses 8 through 12 to see where it describes and talks about this manifold wisdom of God. Ephesians 3, 8, To me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. This manifold wisdom being made known by the church is not the concept of the church preaching to the world, of evangelizing the world. But as he says here that these principalities and powers, when they see the church, they see that manifold wisdom of God. It would be sort of like us holding a precious jewel, a diamond, and looking at it and appreciating it and its beauty from different angles, the way that it's cut, the way that the light shines off of it, reflects off of it, or shines through it, that we would look at that and see how beautiful and how wonderful that is. And when we look at the church, along with these principalities and powers, we see the great wisdom and the great beauty of God. We see in it God's eternal plan in Christ. We see the execution of God's will in spite of man's rebellion and man's resistance against that will. And we see his great plan of eternal redemption for our souls. So we want to go through and think about the church from several different angles, different relationships, or different ways in which the Bible describes the church to have a deeper understanding and greater appreciation for it, and for us to stand before God and appreciate his plan of redeeming man and the wisdom that is in that plan. First of all, we want to notice the relationship of God's people to the world is described as the church, just very simply church. Now that word church, of course, comes from the original word that is called ecclesia, and it's a compound word. The word ek means out of or out from, and klesia means to call. So you put those two together and put it into the way we would say it, it is the idea of the called out. That we are called out of the world into the church of our Lord. If you go to Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 19 and verse 39, this word is used here for an assembly, an unlawful assembly at Ephesus. Remember that Paul was preaching at Ephesus and his preaching had such a great impact that the people became very angry. In fact, Demetrius the silversmith incited a riot. They went into the theater at Ephesus and they rioted for hours on end. And when that riot is being calmed down and the crowd is being addressed, the city clerk says to them in Acts 19 verse 39, but if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. And it's just simply saying there is 
a group of people that have been called out. They've been called out of the city or they've been called out of the region, wherever this lawful assembly would take place. He's saying that's where this should be done, not in this unlawful assembly, this unlawful action that we are taking, but just simply the idea of a gathering. And the Holy Spirit took that word that was in common use in the first century and gave it a special meaning and application to the people of God who are called out from the world around them. If you notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14 beginning, it says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The idea of the children of God being separated from the world around them. Here is given the understanding that you do not go and have fellowship with idolaters. You do not go in and worship with them. You do not go in and participate in those idols' feasts with them. You are to separate from them because you are not to be yoked with unbelievers. You are not to have fellowship with lawlessness. You are not to go in and have communion with darkness. But be separate from them. Stand out from them. The child of God is not to blend in with the world, but is to be transformed from the world around them. As the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we're different from the world around us in our religious beliefs and our religious practices as Paul noted in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. But we're different in other ways as well. We stand apart from the culture that predominates the society around us. In Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians 4 and verse 29, the apostle writes this, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. We're not to use the type of language that the world around us uses. They use coarse and crude language. They say things that are shameful to say, shameful to talk about. And we're to be different from that in the way that we speak, the words that we use. The conversations that we have are to be different than the world around us because we're called out of that world to be transformed from the world around us. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy 2 verses 9 and 10, the apostle makes this note, In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness, with good works. So we stand out in the way that we speak and we stand out in the way that we dress. We don't dress like the world around us. We don't put things on or take things off to draw attention to ourselves. We're not flamboyant in that way. We do not act in a suggestive manner and dress ourselves in a suggestive way for the world to gawk at our bodies because we're different from the world around us. We are to be different in our socialization or recreation in 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, remember verses 3 and 4? The apostle writes this, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. When you read that verse there, you see the way the world behaves. You see the type of socialization they are involved in, the type of recreation that they practice. If they go to the lake or if they go to the mountains, what do they do? They go golfing. What do you often find? They're drinking. It's an excuse to go out and do something and to drink and to become inebriated. 
And it talks about the lust and how so much of it is involved around sexual activities. He says, we have spent enough of our past, of our lifetime doing that, verse 4, in regard to these things, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. You see how we've been called out? We've been called to a different way of life? That we don't involve ourselves in those things. We don't act like that. We don't behave like them in drinking and being involved in lust. Because we are a separate people. We've been called out of that darkness, out of that culture that is an abomination before God. And as we studied in our class this morning in Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul tells us there that we are to be lights that shine forth in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Philippians 2 verse 15. When we are lights, that means we stand out. This is the idea, just like if you were to see a, a bright and shining star on a dark night. And how that star shines brightly against the blackness of space. We're to shine forth like that in the world around us. And that means people are going to notice us. People are going to see us. People will see by the way that we live, the way that we talk, the way we dress, the way we behave. They're going to see we are different. And sometimes that brings ridicule. Sometimes that brings opposition. Sometimes that brings mockery to us. And even people's trying to do us harm. But the Word of God tells us this is what we are to be as children of God. We are to be separate. We are to be called out. We are to be different than the world around us. That's what the church is. Those who are called out and stand separate from the world around them. The church is also described as the house of God as we have a relationship to one another. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, says, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. The house of God implies a relationship of family. Our relationship to one another is like having a family relationship because we are related by blood. Not the blood that runs in our veins, but the blood that has cleansed our souls. The sacrifice of Christ was given so that we could be forgiven of our sins. And when we are forgiven of our sins, we are brought into that household of God. We are adopted as the children of God. We have a Father in heaven, a common Father, to whom we look and whom we serve. We love and do His will. In Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, let's understand that it describes Jesus here as our brother. We would think of Him as our elder brother. He's the firstborn. He is the one over the house of God. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, it says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. And in the context, it's the idea we're all of one family. We have one Father. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. We are brethren. Christ is our older or elder brother. Being all under the Father in heaven. And we are brothers and sisters to one another. That's the relationship that we sustain. And we are to look at one another as family. Thinking about each other. Serving one another. As 1 Corinthians chapter 13 admonishes us that we are to have love at all things that we do. I'm thinking about your best interests and you're thinking about my best interests because we're family. We're committed to one another because we are family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Galatians chapter 6, I want us to notice this. Galatians chapter 6. That we are committed to helping each other spiritually as family. In Galatians 6 verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. 
We're looking out for each other's souls. We're striving to help each other to get to heaven. Because family looks out for each other. Family tries to help each other to be better, to do better. We look out to protect one another. So spiritually, we're looking after one another as family. If you drop on down to verse 6, he switches it to the physical realm. It says, Let him who is taught in the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. When our brethren in need, the New Testament teaches time and again we're to step up and to meet that need. When our brethren are lacking in this world's goods, we have the ability to help them out. We are to step up and to help them out. Because we're family. And that's what family does for one another. When each other has a need, we see that that need is met. We see that there's no lacking. There's no wanting there. We do that spiritually. We do that physically. Because we are of the same household. We're of the same family. We all serve the same father. So when we look at the Bible, we understand that our relationship to the world is the church, the called out. Our relationship to one another is a family. As far as the church is concerned in government, it is described as a kingdom. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And notice verse 15 here. It says, Which he will manifest in his own time, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. The idea of potentate is sovereign. It's the idea that Jesus Christ is a sovereign king ruling over His kingdom. And we know that He has absolute authority in that kingdom. In Matthew 28 verse 18, He says, All the authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. So He is the king. He is the ruler. He is the monarch over that kingdom. We understand that our king is omnipotent. That is, he's all powerful. In John 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. It tells us that Jesus Christ, the king over the kingdom, was the one who brought all things into existence. He had a hand in creation. He brought it into reality, this physical universe that we see around us. Life that is here on earth. Christ is the one who is the agent that brought that into being. That is the king that we serve in this kingdom. And he, we understand, is our benevolent protector. If you go to John chapter 10, John 10 verse 11. In John chapter 10 verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. There are monarchs that serve in this world, ruling over nations, over peoples, over societies, that have done so selfishly, for their own pride, for their own gratification, for their own advancement in this world. Jesus Christ did not come, and he does not serve as king over his kingdom for his own selfish purposes. But he serves as king in the idea of a shepherd king, of one who is serving us, one who is looking out for us, one who is protecting us, one who is providing for us. He leads us, if you will, as the psalmist says, into green pastures and beside the still water. He provides for our needs. He is a monarch. He is a king. But he is a benevolent protector as our king, as our Lord. We understand that being in that kingdom, we are a royal priesthood. As 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, where he says there, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're a royal priesthood in this kingdom. 
being citizens of that kingdom, we have responsibilities and we have privileges that we enjoy. We understand that we are obligated to submit to the laws of the king. Remember in first, or rather Matthew chapter 28, Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20, when the Lord had said He had all authority in heaven and on earth, and He gives that great commission in Matthew 28 verse 19, He said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. As citizens of that kingdom, we are responsible and obligated to follow the laws of the kingdom, to live by that law that the Lord has given that we might please Him, that we might praise Him, that we might receive the benefits that come from being a citizen of that kingdom. We are responsible to be a light and to set an example for the world to see. When they look at our life, they should see that we are a citizen of the kingdom, that we are committed to our Lord and Savior. In Matthew chapter 5, remember Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verse 14, says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So again, as we have discussed before, with the other ways that the church is described, and those who are a part of that church are described, we're a light. And when we are shining that light, Others can see what it means to be in the kingdom. What it means to be servants of the king whom we serve. We have a blessing as citizens of this kingdom. As Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ that we're looking forward to His return. While we are here on earth, we enjoy the privilege of forgiveness. As a child of God, observing His laws, following the King, we have fellowship with God because our sins have been taken away. And as a child of God, we can call on Him as our Father. Other people cannot call on God as their Father because they are not children of God. But those of us who have entered into the kingdom can have access to Him through prayer. And we enjoy the peace that passes understanding. As Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We have an assurance. We have a confidence. We have a comfort as children of God, as citizens of that kingdom, that we have a relationship with the king who's looking out for us, who cares about us, and has an eternal reward awaiting us. He knows what's going on in our lives. And as that good shepherd, he is working for what is good in our lives. And if we patiently follow him, we patiently serve him, that good will come. The church is also described, of course, as a body in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. It says, And He put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. It describes Jesus here as the head over all things to the church. Again, that goes to the idea of His authority over the church, His authority to rule in the church. And as the head of the church, as the head of the body, He has the right to guide and direct. And the only way the body functions properly is if it follows the lead of the head, follows the directions of the head. And we as members of that body fulfill a role within that body, if you will. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 
there's an extended discussion beginning in verse 12 where Paul talks about the members at Corinth having different gifts, different abilities. Now, in the context, he's talking about the miraculous gifts, the miraculous abilities that they have. And they have different gifts, and they have different abilities, but they all come together to serve that one common body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, we want to grab the language here where he says, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. The body of Christ being the church of Christ, as we read in Ephesians chapter 1. He is the head of the body, which is the church. So here he's talking about the church of Christ or the body of Christ and having individual members. So we may be a foot, we may be a toe, we may be an elbow. Different parts, but we all come together to form that one body. And we all have something to contribute to that one body and to appreciate the other members of the body that contribute to the well-being of the body. In Ephesians chapter 4 then, let's read this. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 11. Let's read down through 16. Think about the individual members, the contribution that they make. Ephesians 4, verse 11, And He Himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. As members of the body, we all contribute to the well-being, to the health of that body. And here he's talking about the idea of us building that body up. We are to give encouragement to one another, talking to each other, appreciating one another, inspiring one another, praying for each other, Praying together, as well as praying individually, but praying that we may be strong and faithful and true and praying for one another's struggles and challenges and hardships and setbacks and difficulties, that we're appealing to God for one another and for this work. We contribute to this body and helping it to be healthy when we come to the assemblies. Sunday morning class, Sunday worship, Wednesday class. When we have gospel meetings that we come, we attend, we are here to encourage and strengthen one another. That is part of our duty, part of our responsibility as members of this body. And as we said before, we bear one another's burdens. We do not act in a way that we tear each other down, thinking only of ourselves. We do not say, well, I'll let others do that and refrain from contributing to the work staying away from the assemblies, not being here to encourage and edify, to provoke, to stir one another up to love and good works. Because as a part of the body, we recognize I have a duty, I have a responsibility. And I want to be here to encourage and strengthen and build each other up when the saints assemble. We do not get involved in the complaining, the gossiping, the slandering that would tear that body down. And we understand that as a body of Christ, Anything that is cancerous to that body, we need to remove. We need to get out. Because it will destroy that body. And so as a body of Christ, we work to build each other up that we may have a healthy body here, that we may all fulfill the will of God and be close to Him, have fellowship with Him, and look forward to that home in heaven. If you will, open to number 835. 835. When you look at the church, you do indeed see the manifold wisdom of God. You look at it from those different angles. About being a body of called out people. About being the body of Christ. About being a kingdom. About being a family that serves 
and worships God together. We see His wisdom. We see that infinite wisdom in redeeming man and how that we are blessed to partake of that eternal plan that He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Acts chapter 2, toward the end, it says that the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. If you back up in the chapter, of course, you understand that He's already taught them that Jesus is Lord in Christ. And they said, what do we need to do? And He told them they need to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then it drops on down to say that those who are being saved are being added to the church. So the way that we get into this body, the way that we enter into the kingdom is through belief in Jesus as the Son of God, repenting of our sins and being baptized to have our sins washed away. And if you've not done that, won't you do it today? You can be a part of that kingdom. You can be a part of that body. You can be among the called out that stands out from the world and is looking forward to a home in heaven. And if you've already done that, but you recognize in your life you've not been committed to that body, you've not been contributing to it, maybe you've behaved in a way that you've brought shame and reproach on that body. You need to confess it. You need to seek God's forgiveness and His mercy. We invite you and we encourage you to do that now. Whatever your need may be, won't you come forward while we stand and sing?